Hi all, uh, Dr. Clark here again, and today we're going to do a natural resource lecture on evolutionary ecology. Okay, so we talked about evolution last time and how um, species can change over time, or at least their genetics change over time. The evidence for that, whether it be molecular clocking, you know, um, protein analysis, fossil evidence, anatomical record. Um, convergent evolution. There's tons and tons of evidence for evolutionary change. Today we're going to talk more about how evolution and ecology um, coincide. How, th how do they play a role with each other? Okay, And so we're going to discuss things like sexual selection. So here this is a male <coughs> grouse, um, sometimes called a uh, um, sage chicken or prairie chicken okay um, it's a it's a grouse that um, the male have these big pouches uh, some of you have probably seen different varieties there's quite a few different varieties um, but they have these pouches and they'll do dances okay there's sharp tailed grouses prairie chickens sage grouses lo lots of different varieties and the males will do a dance and they'll you know be dancing in this region, this area which is called the lek, and the females will come in okay, and pick the most attractive male. Okay. Really, we're still figuring out about why males choose certain areas because um, there's no food in those areas, there's, or limited food, there's no real nesting habitat. Um, most of the time, it just seems like it's just a random place on the landscape that these males choose but they'll keep coming back to the same area over and over and over again for literally we think probably hundreds if not thousands of years they've been coming to the exact same area and why that area we really don't know um, but we know it's important to them and if you put something there or you change that habitat they're gone okay? and maybe they don't breed that year or the next year or maybe they don't breed for another 10 years okay? and so it can be a huge issue and we'll, we're going to talk about that evolutionary ecology why certain things happen um, and sometimes we don't know so let's first talk about things that we do know okay? and we do know that certain things will limit where an organism can live okay? These are environmental factors, and um, they can include lots of things, like physiological stress. So the region at which the organism can live is dictated by temperature, certain precipitation or moisture levels, pH levels. So we can talk about soil pH, we can talk about water pH levels, amount of light, amount of nutrients. Okay? There's all kinds of physiological stresses that can dictate whether or not you'll find a species in a given region. Competition with other species. So um, we'll come to this, um, we'll get around to this, but uh, species compete for nutrients, for resources, habitat, okay, for available water. And if there's competition between two species, um, often one species will win out, okay, or we'll get the majority of the resources. And then there's other factors like predation, parasitism, diseases okay, that can play a you know major role in determining where an organism can live. Okay? And we'll come back to some of these um, as we move on. Okay? So first, Justice von Lindbergh okay, came up with a predictive value. He's a chemist, but he came up with um, kind of a predictor which he called the critical factor and this was um, that there are certain demands certain single factors often that will dictate whether or not a species will be found in a given region okay? and so he called those critical factors again he's a chemist but he was also kind of an agricultural chemist um, and uh, played a huge role in discovering the nitrogen cycle and, and whatnot. You know, um, well-respected 
scientist, but um, he pointed out the fact that basically often if you're trying to figure out where an organism is distributed on the on the planet, okay, you can most often pick a single factor, okay, and that will determine what it is. So it's one of those factors that I listed before. One physiological factor, one competitive factor, something is the critical factor. Okay. And from from Justice's work, Victor Shelford's work then kind of built upon that and he developed what we often call the law of tolerance. Okay? That organisms will exist in a given region okay? um, kind of on a spectrum. So you can see this tolerance spectrum or tolerance range. Okay? The optimum spectrum is where you're going to find the highest level of that population for whatever that organism is. Okay? If the tolerance, maybe this is temperature, so if you're moving towards uh, their maximum temperature for a given species, okay, the closer you get to that maximum line, the less species you're going to find. Okay? Same thing on the opposite side. The closer you get to the minimum of that line, the less species you're going to find, the less individuals you're going to find. Okay? And so this is what we call the tolerance range, or the optimal range of a given organism. So let's look at kind of a more specific example, or at least a more pretty example. Okay? So you might have these butterflies here, you know, some species of swallowtail, okay, that in their optimal range, and maybe this has to do with temperature, okay, but maybe this has to do with salinity, um, humidity, something. Okay? It's often based on physiological stresses. In the optimal range, you'd expect high species abundance. Right? Towards the maximum end of that physiological stress, species are going to be much more infrequent. Okay? Towards the minimum range of that species or that physiological stress, okay, infrequent. Okay? And so now, does that mean that this can't change over time? No. And that's the that's the great piece of the evolution curve component. Let's say this butterfly here can live at that thermal maximum okay, and is reproducing. Now, its offspring are probably going to live at that thermal maximum also. Now, what happens if the environment loses this piece and it starts creeping this way? Well, this individual or these individuals here that can live at that high physiological stress are going to become more abundant. So you might see this big shift of the graph, and the graph might be shifting in this direction. Okay? And this is why, especially when we talk about global climate change, this is why it's important for the climate or for physiological stresses to change slowly. Okay? They need to change at a rate slower than the rate of adaptation. Because if you change physiological stressors, extremely fast what might happen is there's not enough individuals over here to maintain the species and okay? so this graph shifts in 50 to 100 years and it shifts all the way over here and maybe that is only two degrees celsius but it shifts over here to to being the norm is now here it's possible that all of these organisms go extinct okay? and that's what we're seeing with some um, environmental in events um, and we'll talk about some of these species that um, have been what we call uh, shifted off the mountain so we see that you know organisms that require things like snow for a portion of the year okay, or certain temperatures and they need, might need glaciers okay so there's things like glacier worms and and um, there are uh, organisms um, in the group um, Gryllidae or Gryobladidae okay, that are so thermal, thermally constrained that if you find a Gryobladidae, it looks kind of like a black cricket. Um, if you find one, and I'll, I'll put some pictures up later, but if you find one um, and you pick it up in your hand, it'll die because the temperature difference between your hand and their body um, is so severe that they, they can't handle warm environments. They, they live on the ice 
Okay, and they feed on algae and things like that that grow on the ice. Well, when the ice is gone, the organism's gone, and um, so we have so many environments that the glaciers are gone from the mountains that these organisms don't exist there anymore, and they've gone extinct. Okay. We'll come back and talk about extinction, things like that later. Okay, so these critical limits can stack up, though. So you can get more than one of these physiological stresses that's driving these populations. So maybe you got a temperature um, tolerance issue, but also that change in temperature might have brought a new predator to the region. Okay? So now you got this predation event, or it might have brought new diseases or new parasites to the region. Okay? And that really um, often will be compiled, so you might not just have a temperature influence, but you might have other influencers that are determining where those species can be found. Okay. The other thing that you can often see is that maybe part of the life cycle is disrupted. So there might be critical limits um, that differ between young offspring and adults. Okay. And we often see this, you know, in the case of like, you know, organisms that, you know, um, for lack of a better term, abandon their young. So say like a salmon or a trout or most fish, okay, they, you know, build a red or a nest and drop their eggs in it and then they leave, okay? And the young hatch and then fend for themselves in that environment. Well, the adult doesn't fend for themselves in that environment. The adult is gone often, okay? And so it's the young environment. Well, different tolerance limits may differ between, you know, the young and the adult. Maybe the adult can withstand the changes to that aquatic environment, but the young can't. And this doesn't just go for fish. This is the case for lots of organisms, okay? Lots of insects, lots of plants, um, you know, lots of microbes and things like that um, that have really no uh, child care or anything like that. Okay, so the other thing that we can often look at is these species requirements, so the, the temperature requirement, the humidity requirement, the predator uh, you know, prey interactions, the habitat requirements, these are indicators um, of change in an environment. Okay? So if a species needs a specific temperature range and, you know, due to human actions, that temperature is now, you know, increasing. Okay? A great example of this is if you look at the Pacific Northwest, our logging practices in the 60s and 70s and really coming up to that, but that's when we started collecting data, <clears throat> where really it was a poor practice. Okay? We were logging along rivers okay, right up to the stream okay, or the river. We were logging right up to the water line and what was happening is we weren't getting logs that are falling into the water, so it wasn't slowing the rivers down anymore. But we also weren't getting any shade. And so the water temperature was rising. Okay? And it was going past the thermal maximum of a lot of the fish. Bull trout, rainbow trout, um, you know, different types of salmon, chinook, sockeye, coho. Um, there are rivers that they couldn't support these fish anymore, so it wasn't just the dams okay, that we were putting on the rivers and had put on the rivers, but now it was these logging practices that increased the temperature and it was past the thermal maximum. Okay. So these species became indicator species. Uh, so if you found something like a rainbow trout in a river, okay, you knew that it was, especially if they were breeding, you knew that the temperature and the habitat was good enough for those organisms to live. Okay? And there's lots of indicated species. Often in aquatic environments, we use aquatic insects. In terrestrial environments, it just depends on you know what what kind of terrestrial environment it might be. Sometimes it's like prairie grasses or certain types of flowers. Um, you know, if it's a forested habitat, it might be a certain type of insect or a certain type of plant or um, you know things that can't tolerate much. Um, changes. These are typically called indicator species.
Okay? So a habitat is really the place um, or some kind of set of environmental conditions where particular organisms can live. And then ecological niche, there's a couple different types of ecological niches. You can have what we call the fundamental niche. Okay? A fundamental niche means that it's a set of characteristics that would support that organism. Okay? So maybe we're talking about a temperature profile, humidity profile, a number of competitors in the region, the habitat, the food sources, these kind of things that would fit a certain species. That's the fundamental niche. And then what we call a realized niche is where do you actually find that species. Okay? And realized niche basically means that, hey, look, due to competition or due to the fact that you have other species in this region that might be um, predating on this individual or competing for certain resources, competing for habitat, these kind of things, this is where you actually find that species. That's the realized niche. We'll come back and we'll talk more about these when, when we talk about environmental change and things like that. Okay? Outside of ecological niche or more towards um, organisms and how we lump organisms, we often lump organisms either as being a generalist, which means that you can pretty much find them anywhere any, you know, they have a very broad niche, which often means that those optimal ranges for temperature, humidity, predation, whatever, they're much bigger, okay, for um, a generalist. And then specialists have much more narrow niches, and this can be based on, you know, temperature pro profiles, these kind of things, but it also can be based on, like, food resources. You know, what do they eat? Okay, so, like, the giant panda. You know, it's going to be eating bamboo okay, for the majority of its diet. Okay? So it's going to, to be limited where do you find these certain species of bamboo that the, the panda will consume. Okay? And so you get these specialists that only kind of feed on one thing, and that's going to determine where that species is, is found on the planet. Okay? So Gregory Goss came up with a principle which we call competitive ex exclusion, okay, which basically states that no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. Okay? So if you have a set um, given you know, temperature, precip, habitat, food resources, and it's the same for two species, they can't actually occupy that at the exact same time. So one has to give. One has to either move to a different region, one has to occupy that ecological niche at a different time period. So maybe one goes nocturnal, one's diurnal. Okay. So this is Gregor Goss's principle of competitive exclusion. From his work, okay, we really started looking at examples of, whoa, Species do coexist in the same habitat, okay? and they do look like, at least initially, they look like they're occupying the same ecological niche at the same time. And you know, um, many examples of this have occurred. Okay, but Robert MacArthur's work on warblers, and then his work on island bi biogeography and ecological niches, um, MacArthur was you know, an amazing ecologist that we lost um, due to cancer at the age of 41. So he, he didn't, I mean, he didn't have much time um, to be an ecologist, but he wrote many books in his limited time as an ecologist. And, um, you know, he's an excellent, excellent ecologist. And a lot of the ecological concepts that we use today are due to Mark MacArthur's work. Okay, one being resource partitioning. Okay, so here this is a classic um, example of MacArthur's PhD work, where at first glance, if you look at this tree, you're going to find you know five, in some cases more than five different warbler species. Okay, and it seems like warblers eat insects. Okay, and it seems like 
that they're all occupying the exact same niche. It's one tree. It's one species of tree. Okay, But when you start looking at these individuals, and this is what MacArthur did, when you start looking at the individual birds, they don't overlap with each other at the same time. So you have these escape areas. So you might have this yellow rump warbler, which is going to feed in the bottom part of the canopy. Okay, It can encroach back up into the black-throated green warbler, or the bay-breasted warbler. It can encroach into their habitat, but it always has this escape. All these species have an escape. Okay? And so they don't completely overlap with each other. So they do what we call resource partitioning. Okay? They spend time consuming in areas until the competition gets too heavy, and then they move to a different region. Okay? And they do this, and they partition out the resources so all the organisms can occupy the same given tree, but they're occupying these little teeny niche communities at different times right, and partitioning these resources out. Okay. All right, so speciations. Speciation events are the development of new species. Okay. So let's first talk about what a species is. Okay. And there are lots of species concepts out there. There's this one which is called the biological species concept. And then there's um, another one called the morphological species concept, and then probably the newest and probably the best species concept is what we call the phylogenetic species concept. But the, the one that's most often cited and most often used, and most people actually know this one fairly well, is Ernest Mayer's biological species concept, which basically says that groups of organisms, actual or potential inbreeding, natural populations okay, are reproductively isolated from other such groups. So in other words, in a nutshell, what he's talking about is organisms that breed together and reproduce viable offspring, so they have to have viable offspring, are considered a species. Right? And organisms that are isolated from that group, either it via some kind of barrier or via um, non-viable offspring, okay? these are not, these are not, are, are considered separate species, okay? so they're not the same species. So in order to have, be the same species, you have to be able to reproduce viable offspring in the same given region. Okay? If you're going to be separate species, okay, you have to be reproductively isolated from each other. Now, there are lots of issues with Ernest Mayer's biological species concept. It doesn't talk about asexual species. It doesn't talk about hermaphrodites. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't work for a lot of things. Okay? But under the general principle, when we're talking about natural resources and the management of, say, wildlife and forests and things like that, it's a perfectly good species concept. So it works on the premise of isolation. Isolation, and so there are lots of different ways that organisms can be isolated. Okay, and one is geographic isolation. Okay? This is probably the most common cited type of isolation, and that would result in what we call allopatric speciation. So an example of this would be you take a squirrel species that occupies a, a given region, maybe two mountainsides and a valley. Okay, and then we decide, as humans do often, that we're going to log maybe the valley. Okay, so the valley, we make it devoid of all trees. We clear cut it out. Okay, so now this original one species is now isolated. This species is not traveling across this valley okay, because there's no food, um, there's no shelter or anything like that from predators, so they're not making that venture over to this population and these two populations become geographically isolated or reproductively isolated which means that genetically there's no interchange of genetics between those two populations so over a period of time okay, um, depending on the species you, you could get genetic changes resulting in two separate species.
Another way at which this can occur is what we call sympatric speciation. Okay? And that is, there is no barrier. There's no physical barrier between two populations. Okay? But rather, they're isolated by some other mean. Okay? And so th this can happen on lots of different terms, lots of different ways. We can have what we call polyploidy, which means that you know, through a mutation, the organism developed extra chromosomes. Right? So now the two species, if they even made it together, okay, they couldn't produce viable offspring any longer. Um, you know, there's a term that we call homozygous advantage. So it's sometimes in populations, rare genes will pop up and give the homozygote an advantage in nature. Okay, and homozygote just means that they have two of the same alleles for a gene. Okay, so two copies of the same gene. Okay, and so they might have this advantage. So maybe, you know, in nature, um, maybe we're talking about a bird that is all black and then due to a mutation it produces a little red patch on its shoulder. Okay, and that gives us this advantage because all the females are attracted to red. Okay, and so only males that can produce that red patch are are going to get to mate because females are seeking out those individuals. That can divide a population okay, quite a bit and drive population changes over time. Okay. There are other ways that which this can happen. Okay, sometimes we have multiple genes or gene by gene interaction. Okay, that can change a trait. We can have life cycle mutations, so maybe, you know, you get a mutation that changes the timing at which, you know, a group of organisms reproduce. Okay, so you might have two populations and they normally reproduce, um, say, first two weeks of March, but this population over here has quite a few individuals that aren't reproducing until the middle of April. Okay. Now, if those individuals have lots of offspring and they reproduce and, and the majority of the population is reproducing in April and these guys are reproducing in March, these guys now will eventually become isolated. We have a March population and an April population. And there's lots of other ways in which this can occur, and we'll talk about some other examples as we progress through the course. Okay. Now, there are types of selection. Okay. So natural selection really has three main types at which natural selection or ways at which natural selection can um, occur in a population. You can have what we call directional selection. Okay? And this is a shift towards some kind of extreme. Okay? So if we take finches, Galapagos finches maybe, and we're shi shifting in one direction towards beak size and we go completely to one side with big beaks. Okay. There's lots of examples of this. Directional selection is fairly well known. Okay. And you get these big shifts in one direction so much that none of the small build are left in the population. Okay. And maybe none of even the medium build are left in the population. Okay. Stabilizing selection. Okay you could get the extremes are selected against. Okay? So big bills are not um, good enough to pick up medium seeds or, or have a disadvantage. Little bills okay, are outcompeted by the medium bills and, and you get this stabilizing selection where the medium trait is, um, is the one that is uh, selected for. A great example of this, probably the most classic example of this, is birth weights in humans. Okay? So we select against really large babies, okay? so anything over kind of 10 pounds, unless you're in a developed country um, where you can have a C-section and things like that. But if you're in a developing country or you know a country that's medical is not developed in it, you know, and you produce a 10-pound baby, 11-pound baby, 12-pound baby, um, most likely, either the baby's going to die or the mother's going to die um, from those events. Okay, so they're selected against, selected against, you know, really big babies. The opposite is true too. 
you know, selecting against preemies, um, two pound babies, three pound babies in these other countries. And in, you know, the United States, two pounds, even less than that, okay, a lot of time um, those, or, those babies will live, okay, um, through modern medicine. Um, and so it's not resulting in stabilizing selection. But if you look at prehistoric times, historical times for humans, we are definitely um, subjected to stabilizing selection. And that's why, you know, the average weight of a baby is somewhere around seven and a half, eight pounds. Okay. And then the final one is disruptive selection. So this is where the middle group is selected again. So maybe, you know, big bills eat larger seeds better. So, you know, the large seeds are eaten up by these guys. Small bills are eating small seeds, and it's eaten up by these guys. And the middle guys, these medium bills, are outcompeted on both ends. Okay? Disruptive selection will often result, if it continues, into two species, into a speciation event. Okay. So taxonomy, taxonomy is just how we name and, and the relationship that we put on organisms. Okay. And often, you know, it'll be based on where, where are their common ancestors, what's the common traits between these organisms, okay, and that's kind of how taxonomy works. Okay. So taxonomy also really has to do with nomenclature or the naming of organisms. Right? And we use a Latin naming system um, that was started by a man named Carlos Lianus, okay? And it's using a binomial nomenclature or naming system. And that means that you have a genus, which you can see here, Pinus, is a genus for pines, okay? It's capitalized. Now, um, scientific names are always in italics. Okay? The genus and species are always in italics, with the gen genera being capitalized and the species name being in um, lowercase. Okay, so Pinus renosonosa, okay, or the Norway pine, which is the normal common name for it. But again. The reason why we don't use common names is depending on where you're at, it could be called the red pine, the Norway pine, or just a pine tree. Okay, but if you link that scientific name, then most people know what tree you're talking about, okay? and that's why they have a binomial. So scientists can talk no matter what the language is, no matter where that organism is. And they don't need to know a common name, they have a scientific name, and everyone knows what the organism is that they're referring to. Okay. Apart from just genera and species, okay, we also have other categories, more broad categories, taxonomic categories that we lump organisms into. Okay. Starting with the most broad, the domain, then kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay. And here's some examples of that. Okay? There are three domains. The three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And there are six kingdoms. The eubacteria, or sometimes just called the bacteria okay, kingdom. U means true bacteria. So the U part means true. Okay? Um, the archaea bacteria. Okay? And then the groups under eukarya are protista, plantae, fungi, and animalia. So this kind of brings me to how do species interact and what is a driving force. So there's a driving force from an environmental perspective, but there's also a driving force from an interactive perspective on where you're going to find species in an environment. One thing that can be sure there's always going to be competition. Okay? There's going to be interspecific competition, which means competition among species are among the same species, okay? And so this could be lots of things that dictate how many organisms are in a given environment, where they're found in that environment. It could be like how the young are dispersed, okay? Could be, you know, territoriality, uh, resource partitioning uh, between generations, habitat selection, okay? 
Um, lots and lots of ways in which you can have interspecific competition. Okay? Um, and then interspecific versus intra. Interspecific is between two different species, okay? or even maybe more than that. Okay? But it's not the same species competition. Okay? And there's lots of ways in which this can occur. One way is predation. Okay, predation can be intra also. Okay, but often predation is interspecific. It's between two different species. Okay, and that's when an organism feeds on another organism. Okay, now it doesn't matter if it kills that organism. Okay, predation is still being a predator is just feeding on another organism directly. Okay, and now there are different types of predation. You can have things like parasitism, herbivory, okay, these are all forms of predation. Okay? And um, furthermore, you can have predation that basically mediates competition or increases competition okay? or changes the competition factor. And we you guys watched a video on this, okay, with um, uh, nature's Predators, or uh, the video about Yellowstone, um, uh, Yellowstone wolves, and then talking about you know, the great predators of the ocean and predators from Yellow or from Zion National Park, like cougars or mountain lions. Okay, now this predation really can change the ecosystem and allow for organisms that were being outcompeted to have kind of a release and and they can increase their numbers okay? so you might have wolves that are feeding on you know elk okay the elk are eating the majority of the plants and because the elk have been reduced organisms like deer antelope okay other ungulates that would be feeding on that vegetation their populations increase and that's what we see in um, places like Yellowstone when this, when this is, occurs. Okay? There are lots of adaptations out there to avoid predators. Okay? And so you can have toxic chemicals, thorns. Okay? Um, you can have predator-prey cycles. Um, so you get co-evolution between the two groups. Okay? There can be lots of different things. Um, coloration, which you know, it can be harmless coloration, and which we call Batesian mimicry, and this is like an example of like a coral snake, which is poisonous, and a king snake, which is not. Okay, or you can have malarian mimicry, okay, where both species are harmful, okay, and and that coloration is um, dictating that look, these are warning colors. I am in poisonous, or I am a toxic organism. So there's an example of Batesian mimicry. So here you have a yellow jacket, okay, wasp, which is toxic. It does have venom, and then you have this beetle, um, okay, which is a flower beetle that has the same color pattern, okay. And at first glance, by any predator, um, they would think that this is a wasp uh, and stick away, stay away from it. But it's completely harmless. Symbiosis. Um, symbiosis really comes into play when we start talking about two or more species that l are linked together and their fate are linked. Um, and so there's different types of symbiosis. You can have mutualism, where the two organisms both benefit from that interaction. Okay? So fungus and algae combine to make um, what we call lichen. Okay? Together, uh, that mutualistic relationship um, allows for algae to do photosynthesis and the fungus to um, deteriorate rock material and decompose material for the nutrients that the algae needs to make glucose. And together they make lichen. Okay, commensalism, where one species benefits and the other one is not harmed or doesn't have a benefit. And then parasitism, which is, again, like I said before, a form of predation. Okay. And um, it really depends on how uh, dependent that parasite is on that one species. If it only feeds on one species, then 
symbiosis there is um, very tightly linked. But if it feeds on all kinds of things like mosquitoes, okay, um, there's not much symbiosis there. And mosquitoes can feed on any really warm-blooded organism, and in some cases, even cold-blooded organisms. All right, that really brings me to um, two books that I want to talk about. Really, one author, um, a guy named Conrad Lorenz, um, probably the most famous animal behaviorist. Um, so if you're in psychology uh, or you've taken animal behavior, you will take animal behavior, you're going to hear about Conrad Lorenz. Um, he's the individual that described and discovered imprinting this is the only time that uh, a behavioral biologist has won the Nobel Prize. Okay, he's super famous. Um, two books. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors. King Solomon's Ring. Ring is an excellent book about animal behavior and just an amazing author. And Man Meets Dog is another piece of literature that's just great. Okay. Now I'm going to leave you with a little video about a type of parasitism called brood parasitism that most of you probably um, have never seen okay? and is very unique and is kind of an evolutionary quirk that um, we have seen many examples of evolution that try to prevent brood parasitism and then some that just there's no answer to what's going on. So bringing up the young is a very demanding business indeed. And in most birds, it requires the full-time labor of both male and female. But one or two birds manage to avoid it altogether. And one of them is a regular visitor to this reed bed in England. A cuckoo. And she's raiding a reed warbler's nest. That's one of the reed warbler's eggs gone. And while she holds a second in her beak, shuddering with the effort, she lays one of her own. The match is near perfect. The cuckoo's is the one at the front. The reed warblers don't notice the difference and continue incubation. The cuckoo has timed her action with care. She laid her egg immediately after the female reed warbler laid the last of hers, but it develops much faster and will hatch three or four days before the legitimate eggs do. The young cuckoo, blind and naked, now deals with the remaining warbler eggs. Two weeks later, the monstrous young cuckoo is so big that it can no longer fit inside the tiny nest. Its brilliantly coloured gape, together with its call that mimics the sound of a whole brood of warbler chicks, constitute a demand for food that the warblers find irresistible. The European cuckoo's habit is so famous that we tend to think it's the only bird to behave in this way. But there are birds in half a dozen other families that do so as well. Here in Argentina, brown-hooded gulls are nesting. 
Gulls are so vigorous and enterprising that they might seem the last birds likely to be tricked. But on occasion, they are. A duckling. Its true parents, cuckoo ducks, are far away from the nest where they dump their egg. Their offspring will never see them, just as they never saw their parents. The duckling cannot know that it's quite different from the baby gull which has now hatched out alongside it. Nonetheless, something tells it that it must not stay with this other nestling. On its very first evening, it leaves. Unlike the cuckoo, it makes no further demands on the bird that incubated it. Even though it's only a few hours old, it's perfectly capable of fending for itself. Okay, with that, um, next time we will talk about uh, a little bit more about speciation and we'll discuss biomes and we'll discuss um, marine environments and we'll start moving into more environmental science issues.